Well, welcome. Welcome to Endoscopy Now and today's virtual education event on minimizing the risk disposable scopes in the GI suite. I'm Patrick Hurley, Director of Marketing for GI at AMBU, and I will be your moderator for today's event. AMBU is pleased to introduce today's speaker, Nancy Schlossberg. Nancy Schlossberg is the current Program Director at Digestive Health Services at John Muir Health and has spent nearly 40 years in GI nursing and has a broad commercial experience having held positions at Olympus America and Advanced Medical. She previously served as president for both the American Board Certification in Gastroenterology Nursing and the Society of Gastroenterology Nurses and Associates. She's been awarded the SGNA Distinguished Service Award in 2003 and the ABCGN Distinguished Service Award in 2012 and the SGNA Gabriel Schindler Award in Clinical Excellence in 2015. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, first thing we're gonna do is disclosures, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, conflict of interest, you can see, but once again, uh, the planners disclose no conflict of interest, but the speaker discloses a relationship with the commercial support entity, thereby, thereby declaring a conflict of interest. Fees are underwritten by the education um, funding provided by AMBU, and there's no commercial company support, and there's no alternative complementary therapy. So let's get going, talking about minimizing the risks. And again, welcome to everybody. It's one day post-election. So again, we can turn our, turn our attention to uh, endoscope reprocessing and, and the, new, the new world of what's going on in endoscope reprocessing, single use and disposable endoscopes. So our learning objectives today, and we have three of them. We're going to explain three challenges performing duodenoscopy in the GI suite. We're going to discuss the impact of the FDA in driving duodenoscope advances in the GI suite. And we're going to recognize the value of single-use GI scopes in meeting infection prevention challenges in the endoscopy suite. We'll also focus time discussing the duodenoscope a flexible GI scope used to perform endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, or ERCP. So here are some interesting facts that you may or may not know about an endoscopic and ERC procedures and complexity of GI scopes. As you can see, there are typ typically there's 17.7 million endoscopic procedures performed annually in the United States. Physicians uh, conduct more than 500,000 ERCP procedures annually, according to the FDA, and flexible endoscope reprocessing includes over 100 steps and can take up to two hours to complete. More infections and outbreaks have been linked to contaminated endoscopes than any other medical device. Here's an interesting finding, another one. Duodenoscope contamination poses a risk to patient safety, though the risk of infection is relatively small. In a 2018 international study, researchers found that 15% of duodenoscopes were still contaminated after reprocessing. The FDA further proved a contamination risk exists in the United States from results of a post-market surveillance study, uh, study conducted by Olympus Medical Systems Pentax America, and Fujifilm Medical Systems. The studies found that between all three manufacturers' products, roughly 9% of the examined scopes showed signs of contamination, including 5.4% from high-concern organisms such as E. coli and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Such contamination lingers because cleaning duodenoscopes is notoriously complex. The instruments cannot be exposed to high heat sterilization, and technicians often struggle to manually clean their narrow tubing and elaborate moving parts. So in this symposium, this International Cedar sinai Symposium in 2020, Dr. Kenneth Binmuller gave a presentation, the debate, is it wise to use one-time use duodenoscopes? Yes, it is. The key points he discussed in this were, 
patients are reading about du duodenoscope superbugs in the news all the time. The FDA incident MOD reports from 2015 to 2019 show an increase in duodenoscope infection related events. 1,115 duodenoscope infections were reported leading to, to, to 79 deaths or 7%. The reprocessing problem being is more than just the elevator. There's cracks and deposits throughout the channel, all of which can let bacteria and contamination in. And really we have to talk about what are the what if costs of what are the health risks of the patient and the staff, as well as the legal liability. What if a patient gets infected? What are the legal ramifications? Patients obviously have to cost us more. Patients stay in the hospital for longer lengths of stay. They get readmitted. And of course, there's the reputation or the bad reputation that you never want to have. Finally, he states that the safety is worth the cost and equates the safety of new disposable solutions to seat belts and side airbags in cars. So now we're going to set the stage for discussing the three current challenges. So the first of our objectives is we're going to focus on the challenges of performing duodenoscopy and the risk of infections, reprocessing issues, and economic and legal factors. But before we begin, and I always, when I'm working with people, say to them, you're never going to understand any kind of endoscopy or procedures until you understand the anatomy. So once again, here we are. Where does that duodenoscope travel? It travels down into the, to the duodenum which is the first sec section of the small intestine, which receives chyme from the stomach and digestive secretions from the liver, pancreas, and gallbladder. Once again, did you know that, probably did, that the GI tract is about 30 feet in length from the mouth to the anus, and it can take between 24 to 72 hours for food to complete its journey through the digestive system. We are born without bacteria in our digestive system, and the small intestine is the workhorse of the GI tract. And I would focus on you know, that 30 feet because the beginning of it is the scope, although it doesn't go the whole 30 feet, it goes enough from the mouth as it keeps going through the GI tract. So it covers a lot of ground, um, and we have to think about that every time we intubate a patient. So what are current challenges of performing duodenoscopy? We see three current, we see um, three challenges that arise. Let's start with the risk of infection. There are multifactorial issues with duodenoscope outbreaks and infection. So microbial factors, there's detection issues, there's the normal flora, what's, what's, what's the good stuff and what's the bad stuff? What could, what's gonna culture positive and what's gonna cul culture negative? There's multi-drug resistant organisms or MDROs. And they are just as susceptible to high level disinfection as other pathogens, assuming we clean things right, because then there's a resistance to eradication through biofilm formation. And biofilm is, as you probably all know, it's a polysaccharide network that can build up on scopes that are not properly manually cleaned and high level disinfected. And things keep building, building and building upon it, um, whether you can, and you can't see it but it's there and it makes it difficult to clean these scopes. And then there are reprocessing limitations. There's a low margin in safety. You gotta get it right. We're not sterilizing these scopes. They're heat label, labile, as you know. And so you have to get it right the first time as much as you possibly can. Then of course, there's um, other, other problems with the automated endoscope reprocessors. All right, what's the water quality like? Um, is the, is the basin clean? And then very, very important are human factors. And uh, again, who's cleaning your scopes? Are they properly trained? The scopes of the design of the scopes, they're very, very complicated. As we know, lots of, they're covered in, you know, they're, they're, you can't see the insides of them. So you can't see the complexity of the tubes and the wires and things like that. And so you don't know what, what kind of a job you're doing reprocessing. So damaged, of course, damaged elevators can impede microbial exposure to high level disinfection. And again, the scratches, the divots, the tears in the sealant make it, make it a pathway, a possible pathway for any pathogen to get in. 
So here you have this duodenoscope, and if any of you have taken a nice long look at it, and I'm sure you have, there's a whole lot of places that things can get trapped and caught. You can see the elevator wire over here, and you can see lenses, and there's lots of stuff going on. In these pictures, they've kind of taken apart different bits and pieces that they looked at, and you can see, especially um, that the instrument is, is complex. And in A, you see that, although it may not look like it because these things are blown up here, in A, you can see the elevator lever, the elevator lever with the brown layer on both sides of the O-rings. That's the patient side. There's stuff in here. And B, again, you can't see this stuff, but it's scanning electron microscopy photographs of this little teeny screw that fastens the lever access to the forceps elevator. And you really can't, it's not a great view here. You can kind of see the grit and that's, that's what's on there that you can't see. In D, it's the forceps elevator with a brown layer around the axis hole. In E, there's porous looking a porous looking layer in the recess for the forceps elevator. And I'm sorry, it doesn't quite show up as well in the presentation as, as we'd like. Um, in F, you can see water, water droplets. And you can see in, in G, I think that is very familiar to people. All these other parts are microscopic and you go, uh, you go well, we don't, really don't see those. But look at that. That's where the instrument, that's the instrument channel. And it's a little bit loose there's water drip there's water droplets underneath the o-ring in there so it's important again even the most meticulous cleaning is to look at these scopes and see is it loose what are we seeing does it really belong there let's talk about biofilm i told you it was a polysaccharide network that can build up well what does that mean to me they go that's a whole lot of big words and it's like i wasn't a chemistry major that's, that's like what does that all mean well, if you think about it, it's like getting super glue stuck in your finger and that there's a residue even after washing your hands multiple times. And that kind of grosses you out. And it's also, you know, it's the kind of stuff that if you have cut flowers in your house and you leave them around for a while, you get a, a kind of filmy, uh, fil filmy feeling that's hard to get off. That's right on the side of the vase. So again, you cannot see this if it builds up in endoscopes. It's hard to, and it's hard to remove. Again, it's hard to remove and you can't see it. So it's a double whammy in there. So once the biofilm is formed, the microbes within them can be resistant and more resistant to disinfectants. In fact, the bacteria within the biofilm is up to a thousand times more resistant to antimicrobials than if it was the little bacteria were floating around before they all got together and, and formed that polysaccharide network. So again, hard to clean. And you can look down here and you can see a cymepicone droplet in here and they're just, it, things are difficult to clean and can build up a biofilm. So let's look at current challenges in performing duodenoscopy and let's look at the reprocessing issues. What creates challenges here? And I think if you, for any of you who do these, whether you're cleaning them or working with them or doing both, there's, in every facility, the teams find themselves pressed between two conflicting demands. The first is for a thorough, properly reprocessed decontamination of every piece of equipment. The second is for rapid turnaround time in order to maintain an efficient workflow of patient, staff, physician, and equipment. So these two goals put reprocessing technicians in difficult positions. You're always weighing that because somebody's always going, could you, I need that scope, you, uh, and, but you're going, but I want to do the best job I can. And there could be over 200 steps to, reclaim, to reprocessing this, this duodenoscope. And we want to make sure that it's safe for both the patient and, and the physician and the staff who's using it. So staff, if rushed, may miss critical steps for cleaning or commit errors that they mother, might otherwise avoid. And people do it inadvertently. You don't realize when the pressure is on that you've, that you've omitted something that you really said, no, it couldn't possibly be me and I couldn't possibly have done it, but it can happen. And actually when they did, when the FDA um, had the scope, the, the endoscope manufacturers do the post-surveillance uh, surveys, they found this too, that the, this human factor here and the demands may be, may be part of the problem of reprocessing these scopes. 
So here are, are you can see some of the reprocessing complications. In a recent survey of nearly 2,500 reprocessing technicians, 40% reported feeling pressure to work quickly. 30% reported that one of the biggest challenges to reprocessing these scopes is that they can't see inside, which is what we were saying before. And 26% said they don't have enough time to thoroughly perform reprocessing instructions, often consisting of 50 to 100 steps or even more, depending on the device manufacturer. Eight to 17% skipped steps due to pressure. And I always say you could be attached to the other end of the scope, and how would you like that scope to be used on you or your loved one if, or if they were in that 18 to 17, 8 to 17%? So you need to understand the difference between contamination and infection. There's a distinct difference between contamination and the risk posed by infection. Based on a systematic literature review looking at the effectiveness of duodenoscope reprocessing, in which 15 studies fulfilled all inclusion criteria, which included 925 contaminated endoscopes and 13,112 total samples. So the weighted average of the contamination rate after reprocessing was 15.25%. Then, based on a recent cost analysis, recent cost analysis literature, literature the potential infection rate from a contaminated duodenoscope was estimated to be between one to 2%. So this means that up to one in 50 patients having an ERCP will acquire an infection from a contaminated scope. Kind of scary when you think about it. And you, you always, there, therefore you go back to take home messages, make sure everybody take a look at what's going on in your unit. Are people really following the instructions that change all of the time? Are they doing it correctly? Are they rushed? Even following the manufacturer's instructions for use, reprocessing risks still exist. In a 2018 national survey, the Joint Commission found that 72% of hospitals did not comply with high level disinfection and sterilization standards further demonstrating the role of human factors in reprocessing endoscopes. The consequences of not following guidelines and protocols could potentially result in cross-contamination, failure to achieve accreditation, loss of accreditation from the Joint Commission or any of the other accrediting organizations, litigations, and again, very unwelcome publicity for your institution. Let's talk about the economic and the legal factors. So fixed costs, let's look at costs in terms of fixed cost and cost avoidance. A single scope can cost about $40,000 depending on the manufacturer. For high volume facilities, a fleet of duodenoscopes can represent hundreds of thousands of dollars in capital expenditures. In addition to the initial investment, facilities need to factor in the cost of ongoing competency training for reprocessing staff, the cost of reprocessing supplies such as brushes, detergents, and disinfectants, for, uh, and additionally, general maintenance that's related to service, repair, replacement of endoscopes, and end automated endoscope reprocessors uh, that, need, that need maintenance. All of these require maintenance, and there's a cost to it. And you, your cost avoidance is you want to keep your scopes in, top, in tip top shape um, to avoid contamination, spreading infection. So in any time a scope goes out for repair or multiple scopes go out for repair, you lose the use of the scope, which further in, and you, your, your fleet of endoscopes goes down and either you cancel, you delay procedures, or someone goes, well, we need that scope. Could you like put a high priority on it? So the scopes that are left over get used more. And therefore, again, they're, they're liable to, to even get more cracks, crevices, and just general wear, wear and tear. So in it, um, uh, it remains to be seen how reusable scopes with disposable components would shift a financial burden. The novelty may actually transfer, uh, translate into a higher per unit cost, including the recurring costs, again, of repairs and service and replacement of disposable components. 
So let's talk about the legal risks. What are the legal re risks of using reusable duodenal scopes? If a patient, if you guys, a patient or you go to Google the term duodenal scope infection, the first search result has an informative title, what is duodenal scope and how does it work? The link takes you to a contact page for class action lawsuits against hospitals and manufacturers. So there are definitely legal risks associated with these duodenoscopes. And we go back to one of those slides, you know, that we say that it's out there and patients read about this all the time. And certainly during COVID, you know, patients were already afraid to come into the hospital that perhaps it wasn't safe. And then read about this kind of stuff and do your homework while you're home, working from home and having time to look at, look up what's going on. So how about the FDA? With these challenges, the FDA issued and updated directives that hospitals and endoscopy facilities should follow when using duodenoscopes and device manufacturers should follow in designing next generation GI scopes. Um, of course, now that we've put you know, hundreds of thousand dollars into our, into our inventory of ERCP scopes, the FDA is gonna keep challenging us to say, are we doing the best job that we possibly can on cleaning what we have, are they the most up to date? And what other options may be coming down the road? So over the past five years, the FDA has issued directives regarding improving the safety of duodenoscopes. In 2015, the FDA ordered three duodenoscope manufacturers to conduct, remember we talked about that post-market surveillance studies on reprocessing. The FDA ordered device manufacturers to remove older models from clinical use and voluntarily recall older models. In 2018, the FDA issued interim pre-market surveillance results. Remember the, the companies did, did all the studies and here's what they found. Human factor study complete in, uh, showed us um, that, that the human factor is a big part of making reprocess reprocessing difficult to understand. And if you read those manuals, all 150, 100, 200 steps, it is, they are really very, very difficult to understand and to follow. And even if you put them in a checklist form and you go right down the line, it seems it, it is very difficult to follow. So it's just, there's only so, so much your brain can process. So again, human factors as we go through this, just understanding what you're supposed to do, reading it, and making sure you get it done. And in 2019, they, which was uh, the content was updated as of April 10, 2020, the FDA issued recommended transition to do adenoscopes with innovative designs to enhance safety. Well, it's been out there since 2015. Um, we know about all these problems. So thank you, FDA, for finally stepping in. So let's look at the FDA's latest directive. And so again, it was updated in the second quarter of 2020, and they call for providers, manufacturers, and infection prevention experts to reevaluate their approach to reprocessing and transition duodenoscopes with disposable components. So the FDA provided some guidance in the short in the short term during reprocessing. What are you going to do till we get there? So ensure staff are meticulously following reprocessing instructions. And those are the reprocessing instructions from the, from the manufacturer, not the ones that you may have made up or not the ones that were done like five years ago. They're the most current ones. So keep up with all of this stuff, but you have to meticulously follow the, repro the, repro the most current reprocessing instructions. Institute a quality control program that includes sampling and microbiological culturing and other monitoring methods. Consider reprocessing with supplemental measures such as sterilization or use of a liquid chemical sterile processing system consistent with the device's labeling. And hospitals should better monitor reprocessing procedures. Again, take a look at what's going on, walk around. Don't just assume it's being done correctly. Examples here also might include cleaning verification. You know, you're doing the best job you can after manual cleaning with protein, carbohydrate, blood, and, or ATP at the completion again of manual reprocessing steps prior to high level disinfection and or sampling and culturing using the duodenoscope surveillance sampling and culturing guidance that the FDA provided. 
So next, the FDA directs the use of duodenoscopes that have disposable components. Keep in mind that while the disposable designs may reduce um, be, uh, between patient duodenoscope contamination by half as compared to reusable or fixed end caps, this design may lower but not eliminate the risk of infection. To reiterate Dr. Binmuller, it's not just an elevator problem. There's all the other stuff. It's not, there's all those, that wire that goes up, there's all the channels going down, there's all sorts of it. If you ever get the opportunity to look at the inside of, of any kind of uh, endoscope, you will be amazed what's packed in, especially what's packed in at the tip. So the FDA directs developing a transition plan and work to replace your conventional duodenoscopes with newer fully disposable models. And again, to reiterate Dr. Ben Muller, the cost of these newer devices will come down because we want more industry partners to develop these. So everybody goes, well, what's that gonna cost? So again, everybody is working together with the goal of making it safe and effective and be able to have a quality procedure. So in summary, as of April 2020, the products that have been cleared by the FDA are reusable scopes, disposable components, and single-use scopes. To date, the FDA has cleared six duodenoscopes with disposable components that facilitate reprocessing. Both AMBU and Boston Scientific offer a fully disposable duodenoscope. Fujinon Corporation, Olympus Medical Systems, and Pentax have scopes that have disposable end disposable caps. And Pentax Medical also has a, offers a duodenoscope with a, disposable a disposable elevator duodenoscope. And check with each manufacturer for, for specific scope models and parts that are cleared by the FDA and weigh out the, feature, the features and benefits and, see, and really understand what's going on and as we move forward in this new world. So we go back to Dr. Ben Muller's comment that the cost of these newer scopes will come down and we want more industry part, uh, partners to be working with us, but also the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has, has approved some type of reimbursement. Since January 20th, CMS, has provided an alternative pathway for innovative technologies that have received FDA marketing authorization, those ones that I just told you about, and breakthrough design devices designation to qualify for a pass-through payment. So that's for our patients. That's a fancy way of saying that there's a, a TPT or a transitional pass-through payment category that describes single-use endoscopes under the Medicare Hospital Outpatient Prospective Payment System, or HOPPS. And the TPT, the intent of this payment is to facilitate outpatient Medicare beneficiary access to the advantages of new and innovative devices by allowing for adequate payment for these new devices while the necessary cost uh, data is collected to incorporate these costs for devices into a new payment for the whole, um, for the whole procedure using a different kind of scope, a single use scope. So stay tuned, keep up on this, especially as you go to consider what your next steps are, that there is, um, that re there is, some, there is some reimbursement and others likely will follow. Hopefully they will. So what is the value? Let's just talk about a single use duodenoscope for a little, bit, for a little while. Now that we've covered the FDA directives, we're gonna, we're gonna take a little, a little bit more of a look at this. And so what are the advantages of it? What are the features and what are the benefits? Well, there, the single use arrives it's all together in a, single, in a single sterile package that minimizes the risk of endoscope cross-contamination. This definitely improves patient safety and the risk of infection. There's no degradation or decrease in performance over time. Remember I told you when a scope goes out, what you've got left gets used more and more. And obviously when you put things into high level disinfectant or any kind of chemical and you keep using it over and over again, it, 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 doesn't, it, it, it loses, it's not what it was when it was a brand new scope. So when you have a single use duodenoscope, it's a new scope every case. So the single use duodenoscope eliminates both the costs and the need for repairs and reprocessing. 
including removing the staff exposure to chemicals and, bio, and, and biomaterials. And again, I think when people think, well, it's just, you know, we, we, have, we have reusable scope, so we bought the scope. There is more in it than that, especially if you, if you lease your scopes or if you have service contracts on your scopes. It's not just the cost of the scope. There's everything that goes around it, the kind of the hidden costs. There's the extra cost. I don't want to say it's the cost of your staff to reprocess it. And if you work in a facility that uses that where sterile processing does both endoscopes and does sur and does surgical instrumentation, if you remove the the scopes, especially these ones that take a long time to to reprocess correctly, it makes it you can you can it makes um, staff and sterile processing able to potentially do more sterile instruments and get back to the, and get them back to the OR. And there's a standard configuration. It has a familiar design. These scopes look and, and act, we hope um, they do, um, with the familiar design and function. So there's quick adoption and minimal training required. And you can, you can see it looks just like the ones that, that I'm used to from all the manufacturers. And it works the same. It takes the accessories just the same way. Its intended use is, is it's used with the video processor and the accessories that you have and other ancillary equipment for endoscopy and, and, and endoscopic surgery. So you can see it plugs in. It's, it's pretty familiar. It comes out of the package. It's plug and play and you're, and you're ready to go. There's a high def image and it produces, which has a, a view of 130 degrees. The visualization is, is clear of the mucosa and the anatomical structures. And finally, for people like me who live in California, you go, well, what, do, you know, what am I gonna do? What am I doing here with the landfill and everything else? Well, the scopes, there are, they are fully disposable and there's a sustainable program. So again, all the parts, the control section, the insertion tube and umbilical cord are disposed after use. And again, there are programs for sustainable use and they can be disposed of 100% sustainably. And that would work that a third party company partnering with the single use scope manufacturers would set up a system for the products to be converted to energy or repurposed for non-consumer use. If you choose this option, you would dispose the scopes in designated bins that are then sent to a central facility where materials are sorted into metals and plastic. The metals are melted into raw material and the plastics are converted into electricity at a certified waste to energy facility. So those are features and benefits as you look at this. And like everything else um, in my position, uh, we look at things, we have a team and we look at things um, as a team, we weigh out features, benefits, costs, um, what's it gonna do for a program? What would, what, it, what would it do in a GI suite? All the, you know, the pluses and the minuses. And so again, there are many pluses and uh, you just, you have to weigh out what's best for your facility in, in this new world as we move forward. As I say, you could be the person attached to the other end of the scope or your loved one could be. So you just want to feel like in your heart of hearts, your scopes are very effectively reprocessed or you've looked at other options. So in the end, in the summary, we have discussed the challenges associated with performing duodenoscopy in the GI suite, the impact of the FDA driving duodenoscope design advances in the GI suite, and recognizing the value of single-use uh, GI scopes in meeting infection prevention challenges in today's GI suite. And I hope that was informative. I always say if you take home one pearl from, a, from any kind of presentation, that's great, and anything that can improve your practice. But I would open the floor for questions, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much, Nancy. That was great. Um, really appreciate your insight into how disposable scopes can minimize the risk of GI suite uh, in the GI suite. So now I'd like to move into the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, attendees, if you haven't already done so, please submit your questions using the chat box. And so I'll peruse those and ask Nancy.
So her first couple of questions coming in have been, do the scopes come with valves or do you use your own disposable? Uh, it's a one a plug and play. It, uh, it comes, everything is, is single use in there and it comes with the valves. It's good because you don't want to have to worry about thinking what's compatible and what's not compatible. So you spoke about biofilm formation that can become resistant to cleaning or disinfectant. Have you run into biofilm formation that cannot be removed? And what do you do with that scope in those situations? A couple things. Well, since you, you unless, you know, it's really good to do your manual cleaning step as you're reprocessing, you need to take a visual pause and then it's recommended that you do some type of cleaning verification whether it's ATP or blood protein, uh, blood protein or other, you could, that's the only way you're going to find out what's going on. If any of those are positive, um, you probably have a biofilm problem because it wouldn't, you wouldn't turn up. The, it, it means that there's some type of a debris left on the scope. So in those situations, I think I believe every hospital has a protocol for what you do. Um, do you, is it that, okay, it tested positive for ATP or blood protein and carbohydrates? And then what do you do? Do you um, fully reprocess, you know, go back to your leak testing step and your brushing and, and, and go all the way through and test again? And then there's usually hospitals should have protocols and policies and procedures in place when these scopes, uh, when you have a problem in your cleaning verification. Because if you have a problem in your cleaning verification and you put that scope disinfection, uh, glutaraldehydes and base things like that are sticky. So all it's going to do is build more biofilms. So you got to cut the problem before it even gets to be more pro problematic. And again, it's a facility that goes into your policy and procedure, whatever you all decide um, based on ev evidence-based guidelines and what your manufacturer says. And I will tell you when you put together your at the table, there's a lot of people who use flexible endoscopes and you must surely have your infection prevention person on, on your side and understanding exactly what's going on. If you don't, you never want to side, um, you, you never want to have your infection prevention person go, you do what? I didn't know this, this and that going on. So institutions, teams are getting together and, and just starting throwing everything out on the table. And as far as policy and procedure, that would be standard on all the scopes across the entire um, facility. And you would be surprised. Everybody has a little bit different take on things and then come together to develop policy or protocol, especially when things fail. Great. Um... So what about reimbursement for ASCs? We don't charge for equipment like we use, like the hospital can. Well, the hospital actually can't um, for, an, for an ASC or a hospital, any of, depending on the way reimbursement is. Um, for, certainly for outpatient Medic Medicare patients and, the, and those that follow, there's, there, is a there is a facility fee. And that facility fee, so say you're doing colonoscopy with polypectomy, it's easy to look at that one. Um, no matter what, if you're attacking the same polyp, uh, no matter if you have to use three snares and two biopsy forceps, it's all going to come out of that facility fee. It's all bundled. On the inpatient side, uh, it's a little bit different when it comes out of DRGs and you can sometimes get away, get away with charging. But we were talking about this pass-through code just before for the single-use duodenoscope. That is, uh, that is meant to do exactly um, that, so that it's, it's going to cover the cost of that, if you, of that single use scope. Um, I think that people get very mixed up that when you click on something that you charge for it, but that's not exactly true. And it, uh, at least for Medicare, for, for most procedures. And of course, just depending on how you, uh, you negotiate, you get what you negotiate, not what you think you, you deserve. And sometimes it may be that there are certain pieces and certain parts of equipment that will get reimbursed. But again, um, you don't, you know, 
don't think that just because you charge for it, you're going to get paid for it or that the hospital gets paid for it. They don't necessarily. Excellent. Thank you. Here's another one that has come in. Why has the human factor continued to be the largest issue with reprocessing? Because it's people and, uh, you know, and there's a certain amount. If you look at the, you know, certainly the sg &E guidelines for reprocessing scopes, people, you know, you have to be fair, have to write, under, be able to understand the instructions. And I think that the, the weakest, the strongest and the weakest link on any team, endoscopy team, whether you reprocess in your own unit or you set to stop processing is um, the tech. And, I, and I've always said, whoever does that, you should be kissing them and hugging them and loving them because that is, if the person isn't correctly reprocessing your scopes, your scopes go down and you expose yourself to all the liabilities that we just talked about. And I will tell you best practice uh, is you don't want multiple people touching these scopes, especially the duodena scopes. And there's a couple of EUS scopes with elevators and things like that. You really need dedicated, very well-trained techs to take care of these scopes, especially, and especially as new models come in, you can't assume that, you know, the one that you learned on two years ago or three years ago, that, that series of, of scope has the same reprocessing instructions newer ones. And certainly the, the manufacturers seem to keep updating their instructions. So you really have to stay tuned and you really have to devote time and make sure that your techs or, or whoever processing your scopes um, they have that time and can devote the time. To the, scope. The, the other thing that I, I would just add, um, ask everybody to look at SG infection prevention channel program because there you get a person who's really going to be into it's their it's their role and you've assigned them to watch out for all the reprocessing uh, the, uh, reprocessing going on and making sure that the time is really putting understanding the the instructions if you don't understand and you don't have time you can't do it correctly so the human factor until we can put these things on an assembly line or until again we go back to the value of single use. Um, you've got to put, pay time and attention and love those texts. And in many cases, nurses are also cleaning these scopes. They do a great job, but it, it, it takes the being in that dedicated, come in in the middle of the night only once or twice and never really, and you go, oh my God, I've never done a, a you know, clean the duodena scope in the middle of the night. You really got to think about that. So again, dedicating human factor, it's hard to clean them. Got to follow a lot of steps to have dedicated personnel who just the scopes. So we had a, we have another one just along that same lines. What is the most common step missed in the reprocessing process that you've seen? Why do you think that is? I, I think, you know, I have two favorites on that one. Um, I'll, I'll say the second one first. And the set, that second one is take the time out to visualize. You know, they say take the time out to visualize the scope and use either mag, uh, magnification. People are using uh, bore scopes now, if you have that, or any of the cleaning ver uh, verification after manual cleaning. I think that too often it says visualization and you go, okay, I looked at the scope, but you really have to stop and take a very good look at that scope. Um, and you should look at it all the way through, not just at that at that step. If the scope looks like there's something wrong when it comes down um, to or it gets into the reprocessing area. Just take a pause and go, what is going on here? But I think that the, the step, that visualization step is sort of passed over. But I think especially when you talk about advanced procedures, this, the step that I'm always like a little bit leery of is pre-cleaning of uh, pre-cleaning the scope at the bedside. And the reason I say that is when you start doing advanced procedures, a lot of times you'll do like EGD, EUS, ERCP, same patient. And it always seems to me like 
really, you know, you really got to stop and do the pre-cleaning. If you're going to take that, you know, they go, don't send that scope away. We may need that scope again. So the scope misses it, its correct uh, pre-cleaning. And so it's a, you got to take a little pause there and at least uh, suck some stuff up through it before you pull the scope out of the processor and you put it, put it aside. Um, so be careful in your pre-cleaning. And the other thing is that if uh, your nurses or techs or whoever at bedside are doing the pre-cleaning, I've seen multiple sites that have been, that the Joint Commission has not been happy because just because if the scopes, if, 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 if pre-cleaning was done by the reprocessing techs, and they then take it into the reprocessing area. Everybody showed their competencies for reprocessing, reprocessing the scope once it got there. But the people who were at the bedside, the front line, like the nurses who did the pre-cleaning, they didn't have a checkoff list for, for pre-cleaning. So the Joint Commission was all over that one. So make sure that your pre-cleaning is done correctly and really be mindful if you're switching between, between scopes. The, the other one is, um, EGD and colonoscopy, doing doing a flip. What do you do with a with the gastroscope when it comes out? When everyone's going, okay, turn the patient around, turn turn things around, and then and put the colonoscope in. Did you stop and take full care to correctly uh, pre clean the the upper scope, the EGD scope? Excellent, excellent. Does hospital administration fully understand the complete circle of endoscopic costs? Um, that's a loaded question and <laughs> yes. a really loaded question. And um, it depends what costs you're talking about. But certainly when you go, you know, it depends how, how often you purchase your scopes. I think what they don't understand all the time is a scope isn't just a scope. You know, once we bought it for you once, you know, this does not have a lifetime, you know, lifetime use on it that we have to we really have to put a program in place that's going to replace and upgrade your scopes, whether you lease them or whether you look at the whole fleet of scopes and you go, OK, um, every I, I'm, I'm putting these on the sort of the rotational plan of when they're going to get um replaced and upgraded because remember the more wear and tear you put put on the scope the more you risk uh, the, the scope having some a, a problem with contamination and you know so you really and you have to in this day and age i don't know about other people's institutions but money is a big deal and budget is a big deal so you you know you always you have to be able to explain um and one place i worked i remember uh, before i moved out to california um, we, we were trying to go from 15 year old scopes to new scopes. And the only way I could kind of get their attention, you know, there comes a point because they think a scope is a scope and, until they have to go get scope, um, is to say, well, would you rather watch a TV that has tubes in it and antenna or would you rather watch a high def thing? And they got it. Um, if you just, you know, there's, there's an issue of technology and, uh, you kind of, it, it takes, it takes money to make money. And that's, that's also been an argument, but as you go to administration, um, you really need to have a business plan in place. And it's also based on your volume and what you're doing and your shifts in volume, especially as you move into advanced endoscopy, um, with, uh, EUS and more, more URCP and, everything that goes with it. it. It is a commitment, but it's, it's a business and you can make a great business case for, um, for upgrading and, re and replacing scopes. And just hope that it's not one of those years that they go, nobody's getting anything, right? Yep. I've got two questions that are very similar. So I'm gonna ask them together. Um, Based on your field industry experience, what are the greatest barriers to transitioning to single-use scopes? And how has transitioning to disposable devices helped in other areas in the GI lab? Well, the, the you know, disposable devices, and I'm an old GI nurse, so I would reflect back to all of you who, who might remember reusable snares. And um, we also have reusable guide wires and a few other things. But many of you, and I also remember making paplitones. That's another story, sphincter tones. But I think many of you may remember when we switched from and, and 
reusable biopsy forceps. And I used to say you could be replaced uh, by a biopsy forceps uh, because they were about 250 bucks a hit. And how many times did you use them before somebody bent them and they never cleaned them right? And then for snares, we used to have to clean, you know, flush out the sheath and the snare and then soak the wire and do whatever and reload the whole thing. And so just imagine, you know, what a, and not only the time, but the, the time, but, you know, we lose, anyway, there was, there was time and then there was how well did you do it? And those biopsy forceps, at, at, I remember two, maybe it was 350 bucks a pop. And somebody who had some physician who like ran the biopsy forceps down through the instrument channel. And all of a sudden it was a brand new one and it comes out with a kink in it. You can't use it again. So I just remember it was like heaven going to a completely single use biopsy forceps and, um, and snares. So, you know, you just have to keep up, kind of keep up with time and, and um, technology. And that was like my transition. And anytime, you know, when you think about, okay, well, are we going to embark on a disposable or a single use um, a duodenoscope in, in this case? That, again, is, uh, again, a team decision. And I would tell you that please, please have infection prevention with you when you start looking at these options. But you need to, however your hospital or your facility does trials, you're going to have to trial a few of them. And because the physicians, again, there's all the handling characteristics um, that they think that they're used to. But um, again, it has to be, if you put a tool in somebody's hand, it has to be the right tool. And I think the fear is always, okay, well, I'm afraid that I'm not going to like, that the physician's not going to like using this one. And then we're going to have to bring, you know, have a, a regular duodenoscope and it's going to take a long time and it's really going to delay the procedure. But again, you know, if you just think about where things are, are transitioning to, you kind of like kind of do, I think, do due diligence and whatever your uh, facility's protocol is for bringing in things on a trial basis and whoever you work that out with the vendor, I, I really do think it's worth it's worth the trial. I think that there's, um, you know, multiple pieces involved um, with a trial oftentimes when you put it through the hoops and it gets approved and everybody knows it's there. And, it, you know, there's biomed and there's IT and there's, you know, whatever else has to happen. It's, it's sort of a process, but I think it's worth sitting down and, and thinking, is this, you know, is this something that we should be forward thinking and we should be taking a look at so that when someone walks in the door and says, gee, did you know that there are single use scopes and why haven't we tried them? You're one step ahead, especially if you're the manager to just like put it out there. And I always say document that you put it out there and then somebody can't come back and go, we really, why didn't we try that? So anyway, that's, it's all on how you work with, with your team. But again, I think this single use stuff um, the, the scopes, I, you know, again, it's, to me, it's like going, the evolution of going through re, redoing all of your accessories and the cost and what happens and um, the reusables when they, when they malfunction um, and all of a sudden everything is in, is single use and you wouldn't think of using anything that's not single use. And if you do just think about how many million steps there are to reprocess it or, or, or sterilize it. Yeah, there's 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 really just one or two questions which you kind of embedded it a little bit below. She teased it a lot out with this last one. Which, but how do you think single use or disposable options um, will improve current reprocessing issues or minimize risk? Well, it's one and done. You're done. I mean, you know, you you're you're done. Um, it, you plug it in and. Uh, reprocessing risk certainly it's never getting to reprocessing it's done when you're done with the patient it, it's done um, you know there's always a, a risk of not wearing your ppe and other things of, of any kind of cross not even cross contamination but you still should be wearing all your PPE as if you know it's a it's, it's a scope it's a procedure we have you know, all sorts of things going on in there. So I, I do think it's, it's it's done, as I said, um, one and done. My, my and I'll, I'll just give you a question back that people might be asking is, uh, it, it's not a question, it's just a comment. And if, if 
if people are redesigning reprocessing areas, it's very interesting to me. Scope storage is very interesting to me because you know about scope cabinets and safety using the, and the drying cabinets and all those kind of things. And people are designing, you know, taking out, and repl replacing their storage areas for scopes. And you go, wow, if I had a, a single use scope, I wouldn't be worrying about air drying these, these scopes uh, and having new scope cabinets, which are really, you know, with the proper channeling in the air and all the things that have to happen to install them. Um, so I, I think there's, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens, but just kind of think about all the good things. You don't have to worry about all the storage of them. Last, looks like the last question, um, maybe one more. How do we dispose of the single use scope? Um, on one of the slides in here, let me see if I can just go backwards. There you go. Um, again, it just, just like that. <laughs> so uh, again, if you feel like, you know, you don't want to have a gigantic bag, um, then you can think about any of these uh, third party services that are going to convert these to energy and other non-human reusable things. Kind of cool. So it's a, it's a nice option to have there. Great. I think that might be it. Maybe maybe the last question to today will be how might managers and nurses think about implementing single use? And once again, I go back to this is a, you know, a, a team approach here. And it's whatever, first of all, whatever your hospital protocol is for um, bringing in a, a demo, you want to make sure it's for you. And again, team approach to figuring out, is this for us? But you're going to trial it for, first, and then you have to do a good business plan. And for those that haven't, um, a business plan is more than the physician going, we want them and therefore we're going to have them. And it's sitting down and looking at the number of procedures you do and how, what, you, what you estimate your volume is going to be, what your reimbursement is on these, um, what, your, what, what it costs you, things called like contribution margins. And really, really look at it from not, from not only a, a procedure point of view, but from a programmatic point, uh, from programmatic, like, are we growing our program? What, what are we offering? Do we want to be cutting our top technology, cutting edge, what we offer? So you have to be a little bit futuristic about it, but it's going to come out of a, a business plan. And um, if you have a business manager, they're very helpful because they're going to ask for all of those details. Certainly in a hospital setting, you know, they got certain little things you have to fill in and be accountable for and business plans and things that will help you out with that they're going to ask. But it's, uh, you know, it's again, it's all about, it is all about the business and, and features. There's features, benefits, there's clinical. Um, and then and, and from my angle, I like to always look, I like to be the nurse in all this. And as I said, this is the difference between tube TV and high def TV. What are the clinical advantages? And what is you? What would you want to use? And so you have to kind of weigh that out and convince people. Hope that answered the question. Well, thank you so much, Nancy. I, I think this, this concludes today's presentation and Q&A. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, as a reminder, to be eligible for the credits, attendees who filled out the required CNE field during registration will be emailed the course questionnaire directly from an AMBU representative in the next couple of days. Once the questionnaire is completed and returned via email, a credit certificate will be provided to you. This event will also be available for replay on the Endoscopy Now app within a few days in case you would like to revisit the information. Lastly, at the close of this presentation, there will be a survey sent to you. Please complete it if you can. Thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight and enjoy the rest of your evening. Goodbye.